Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Mercer's October Investment Webinar. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners on which of, of the various lands on which we meet today and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Uh, kia ora to our very loyal audience um, who joins us from New Zealand uh, and a special shout out to those in Melbourne, this time not uh, thoughts for your extended lockdown, but um, relief, I think, in terms of the, the good news that we've had in terms of easing of um, restrictions. So well done for surviving uh, that very uh, long lockdown period. Some logistics for today before I introduce our speakers. So we will have a couple of polling questions over the course of the, the webinar. So please be ready, they'll pop up in your Zoom screen. So we'd be um, thrilled if you could help respond to those. Um, we will also have time for Q&A at the end. Uh, so you can submit your questions at any time during the webinar by uh, popping them into the Q&A function within Zoom uh, and we will pick those up at the end. Uh, and finally, as you exit the webinar today, you will uh, get a, a short poll there. Uh, it's really, we love your feedback. So it's so really just an opportunity to give us some feedback uh, and uh, perhaps suggest some topics for future webinars. So if you could complete that on your way out, that'd be fantastic. And now on to introduce our speakers for today. Uh, we've got two topics for you. So firstly, Nick White, our Global Strategic Research Director, is going to take us through the themes and opportunities for 2021. And then Kumal Jalan, our Sustainable Investment Manager, is going to take a look at proxy voting, uh, why it's important, and some of the trends that we're seeing as part of the uh, current AGM season uh, in, in Australia. So with that, uh, I'm going to hand over to Nick to talk about the themes and opportunities. Thanks, Nick. Thanks very much, Kylie. Um, and I guess the first question that people want to ask is why are we talking about themes and opportunities 2021 in October? Well, it is early um, and these aren't out yet. These will be out at the end of next month. Uh, but we wanted to give you a sneak preview, uh, give you an introduction to, to what is coming. They are still evolving, so they may look slightly different by the time that they are finally released, but this is, uh, this is pretty close. But you only get to see them on one condition, which is that you all sign up for the Asia Pacific Forum uh, in early March next year, and then uh, you'll see it in full and also get some insights into some of the research that we're doing around it. So what are our themes and opportunities? You can see them, the three here. So I will at some point call them our TNO, by the way. Sorry, that's just the lingo that we use, but just so you know what I'm talking about when I mention that. Um, so we do think that this decade will be quite different from the past. Um, first, on the left, we are entering a new world in terms of policy influence uh, on the economy and indeed geopolitical tensions between vying superpowers. Um, we're also experiencing business as unusual in terms of both the workplace, we all know what we're dealing with, and the increased focus on broader stakeholder issues. And in terms of position for transition, this decade is critical in terms of managing climate change outcomes and individuals and companies alike will have to make efforts to support the climate transition. Asset owners need to position for that transition now. Next page, please. So the first theme is new world and policy distortion. So what is our new world? One where the influence of policy on the economy is at extraordinary levels. We wrote in last year's TNO that we expected the monetary policy driven environment to develop over time into one also driven by fiscal policy. Well, over time proved to be two quarters. The level and speed of stimulus response to the pandemic has been unprecedented. Not quite as unprecedented as the use of the word unprecedented, but indeed unprecedented nonetheless. And unlike in the global financial crisis, it would aim, aim squarely at Main Street rather than Wall Street, where indeed it was um, very much needed. Next slide, please. So where does that stimulus leave us? It was needed to support alien economies, but there's the risk that the inflationary effects linger on post-crisis. And governments laden with debt must feel tempted to inflate away that debt over time. A period of uncomfortably high inflation is not our base case, but we do not believe, but sorry, but we do believe the probability of such an event occurring has increased notably, especially when we consider central bank shifting rhetoric around inflation targeting. Where we are left with is policy uncertainty. 
And this and the low yield environment and corresponding low expected returns from bonds means investors need to radically rethink defensive toolkits. The constructive view on gold that we posted at the beginning of the year has been ten tempered somewhat by its rapid price rise, but then just about every other defensive asset class and strategy is expensive right now. So it remains an active area of research for us right now. Indeed, solving that defensive toolkit problem is a key area of focus. Next slide, please. We're also in terms of the new world, um, in terms of what we call vying powers. In an area where the world splits into vast power blocks and globalization is stalling, it's important to consider our regional exposures. China America is likely to become China and America again, with resentment on both sides of um, over trade, spheres of influence, and indeed origins of COVID-19. China proved relatively resilient through this period as evidenced by forecasted positive GDP growth for 2020. The IMF have just come out with those numbers um, during the last few weeks. Uh, so the growth juggernaut of China clearly is powering on. And it's worth noting that that growth juggernaut is increasingly domestically generated, meaning that a focus on specifically on China is very important. We do see a two track system developing, particularly in tech. Investors should consider the ramifications of this trend and diversify appropriately. The risk case here is one of forced divestment, although that level of economic warfare could be painful for both sides. Another aspect to think about, which is related to COVID-19, is the stress in relation to supply chains. Supply chains, it just, it just shows just how sensitive supply chains are. And as uh, companies look to refocus their supply chains on, on resilience, uh, that could have implications for the, the, global, the level of globalization today. As we move on to business as unusual and the workplace, next slide, please. We all know what has happened to the workplace. Behaviors changed overnight. They had to. Of course, now as we recover gradually, we're lucky in that regard, certainly in Australia and New Zealand, we will see to what extent those behaviors and practices change back as people have embraced working from home and indeed the power of Zoom, look what we're doing right now. The full impact on real assets uh, from that transition is yet to play out, but we can expect divergence between high quality and second tier office space and continued support for data centers and logistics as the digital world just becomes our world. Onto business as unusual from the markets um, perspective, and the stimulus response has propped up markets uh, in a way that was needed, but also quite striking. Um, the bounce back was fast and furious. Investors had to be very quick to make gains. Clients that missed out on healthy gains should speed test their governance processes to ensure that if policy responds the same way it did in Q1, um, that they are ready to make those gains. Of course, the, the markets have recovered. They've recovered very strongly, but opportunities remain, but they remain for opportunistic strategies. It's less about asset classes today, more about strategy selection and active optimism, uh, opportunism that will really bring you gains going forward. Dispersion in the equity market warns against giving up on value. The stress in credit markets is still to play out in full. The universe of fallen angels, credits falling out of investment grade into high yield territory is still increasing and is expected to exceed previous peaks. In private credit, we expect further opportunities in areas such as rescue finance and complex restructuring. This story has a long way to go. Next area of business as unusual is we firmly believe we're in the age of engagement. This is clearly an area of focus for us for many years, um, but we're definitely seeing an acceleration in the appreciate, appreciation of engagements. Uh, investors care more than ever about where their money is invested. They're recognizing the power of control um, and its value in an era of transition. Increasingly, they want to make an impact uh, a key area of focus for our clients is, uh, is the capacity for impact investing and where they can uh, invest in those types of strategies. Companies are also recognizing the need to shift and respond to this, and uh, the need to shift from a pure sh sh um, shareholder focus to adopting a much broader stakeholder perspective with considerations for communities and the environment. But there are leaders and laggards in this. We expect ESG considerations to be increasingly significant in performance going forward. Work is still to be done on encouraging firms to embrace diversity and inclusion practices that encourage staff retention and enhance decision making. Particularly in the investment industry, 
where women-led strategies are still rare, with only approximately 12% of key decision-maker roles filled by women. Um, this is from Insight Review that we did last, um, late last year. Support for female and minority-owned businesses could actually represent an opportunity as firms with diverse boards tend to have a higher likelihood of outperformance. That's based on some work that McKinsey have done. We move on now to the position for transition. And we really believe that this is a decade of delivery. We've all experienced effects of climate change. Um, and the IPCC, which is the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change, states greenhouse emissions need to reduce by 45% from 2010 levels by 2030 and to net zero by 2050 to have a 50% chance of temperatures rising only one and a half degrees for, um, from pre-industrial levels by 2100. To make that shorter, this translates broadly as we've got to cut emissions by half from today by 2030 to stand a reasonable chance of keeping temperature increases below two degrees, which is already significant. There is a long way to achieve this, but we're already firmly in transition, especially in the critical energy transition area where renewables now compete directly with fossil fuels, not just on environmental grounds, but also on economic grounds. And it's interesting because the commitments to net zero are increasing. Next slide, please. From an investor's point of view, this means position, uh, positioning portfolios now. The Race to Zero is a United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change campaign of net zero initiatives, trying to bring people together. One of the areas with climate change has been, there have been so many initiatives and so many groups that it's difficult to keep a handle on it at times, quite frankly. Um, what the UN is trying to do is to bring all those together in a centralized global um, phenomenon, and that's the race to zero. It actually covers nearly a thousand businesses, 38 investors, 5,050 universities, and actually covers 25% of global CO2 emissions and greater than 50% GDP. And we're seeing membership to a race of zero um, continue to develop over time. The focus on sustainability is certainly increasing more broadly than that. Um, 2019 saw strong flows into the sustainable funds. Uh, Europe has always been a leader on sustainability, but we've also seen strong focus in US, which is uh, not known to be moving at the same speed. Um, those flows have certainly accelerated in 2020. And that's actually quite starkly just um, juxtaposed compared to the net outflows of funds more broadly. Sustainability is certainly becoming the mainstream. And we've actually seen markets respond. Sustainable strategies have outperformed of late and there's been some recent research to show that news around development on climate change um, issues within a, at a company level is actually being responded to well by the markets, such that, that element of change is something we want to invest in in the future. This performance has implications. You clearly want to be part of, part of that trend. You want to be the right side of history, but you also need to not be blind to price. Clients need a strategic transition plan for the next 10 years to hit um, specific targets and emissions by 2030, but also build in flexibility to respond to market pricing. Trends don't move in nice, neat, straight lines. Um, there are excesses and overvaluations and undervaluations that give you opportunity to decarbonize at the right price. So what does all this mean? There's lots of, lots of themes going on. As we move over, we can talk um, a bit more about opportunities and they're all summarized here. From a new world perspective, really what we need to do is really think about a qualitative approach to risk. There's a genuine risk that we're entering a new regime here, which means that all of the embedded assumptions that are in models today really actually just need to be re-evaluated to see whether that is um, where it makes sense. And actually moving towards a scenario-based approach is really um, the best way to go. Inflation risk management. A lot, very few portfolios are positioned well to address inflation risks. There are lots of ways to do it um, through directly through inflation linked bonds, through gold, as I've already mentioned, uh, through real assets and indeed broader commodity exposures. And it's important to get diversity across those, but also be aware that actually the one inflation event you really need to protect against is that stagflation event, low growth, high inflation, because that can decimate portfolios. And that's where the purest forms of inflation protection will come in um, necessary. 
Opportunistic strategies always talk, already talked about how strategy selection will increasingly be more important than asset, as, asset allocation um, in the current environments. Uh, you really want opportunistic strategies like multi-asset credit and hedge funds to really be able to capitalize on those opportunities as they develop. And we're just starting to think about retesting the value of regional strategies. We've tended to work with global strategies for a long time, put those in place for clients. Um, but actually going forward, the position of China as this you know, behemoth, this, this economic powerhouse buried in um, emerging market indices and continuing to concentrate emerging market indices is uh, potentially representing a, a, a less efficient way to get exposed to that area than indeed um, other alternatives and active area of research. In business as unusual, already talked about market opportunities, public and private credit opportunities, coming back to that opportunistic active strategy exposure. Um, it's really gonna be where that's gonna play out. Reassess your real assets exposure, already talked about divergence between quality and lesser quality, um, and perhaps between mo monopolistic uh, infrastructure and more economically sensitive infrastructure. Um, they're clearly, Pulls apart in the way that they have experienced, um, they have performed, and the way they will perform in the future. ESG rat, um, ratings really matter more than ever. We're totally convinced of this. We've really seen it become a very, very significant, um, significant issue in in the last year, and it's accelerated really quite rapidly in terms of the focus in the space. Um, we're not looking for green washing here, clearly, and that's what our ESG ratings are designed to cut through, which is to put a very specific rating on how we value. The, the level and the quality of the ESG experience by that manager. And review your manager diversity. If they don't have diverse uh, management structures or uh, key decision maker teams, ask them why. Um, and at some point it may be worth considering transitioning um, to another manager that does have greater diversity. In terms of position for transition, it means total portfolio climate transition plan. This is an, um, an area of research you'll see very soon from us. So if you're not clear on all the details here, you know, maybe hold fire because there's lots to come. Um, and it means creating 10 year transition plans at the total portfolio level, individual plans for each asset class to decarbonize them in a very sensible way. Um, but not just decarbonize and really transition towards those opportunities for the transition. And this is where we talk about gray, green and in between. So the gray assets which have high carbon emissions and low capacity for transition. Um, the green strategies, which are really solutions to, to the transition and have low, very low emissions and indeed may be helping other companies reduce their emissions, such as renewables. And then everything in between, uh, all those companies that are looking to, looking to transition have set net zero targets, are still developing their plans, but the plans mean something. They have an economic and a market value. Um, and clearly we want to be capturing that value for the future. But that value will move around. We talk about decarbonization at the right price. It's just a play on the words growth at the right price, but growth at the right price. But we do need to be pragmatic. This transition, as we've seen in the last year, is, is not moving in a straight line at all. Um, it, it's gone from quite flat and accelerated to rapid acceleration in, in a period of 12 months. And we need to be aware of where those um, excesses in the markets come from. But it doesn't mean that you should be holding fire. You should be building your transition. You should be seeking out those sustainable assets and strategies across the public and private market space, across equities and bonds, um, such that your portfolio is really positioned for, for a transitional future. And with that, I'm gonna pause. I'm throwing a lot at you, um, but all of this will become uh, clear with the documentation that we produce, as I say, over the next month, but uh, obviously happy to take, um, take questions in due course. Thank you. Okay, so I think we're just going to pop up a poll now just to get a sense of um, where the audience is at with some of these themes. Uh, so you, you should be seeing it pop up on your screen at the moment. So we'll just wait a couple of seconds for some votes to come in. So the question here is, uh, which of our 2020 themes is your largest area of focus? So I can see here we're getting a little bit of a split between the new world and position for transition, actually with position for transition in the winning spot at the moment. We'll just wait for a few more votes to come in before we publish 
the results. There we go. Okay, so yeah, any thoughts on that, Nick? Uh, yeah, I can't say I'm completely sur surprised by that. Um, position for transition, I think everybody is well aware of the need to uh, transition their portfolios for, for the next wave of, um, of climate change management. I, I think um, there are some clients who are incredibly advanced in this space, but I, I think there's a large number of clients who are, uh, are still developing exposures. So this doesn't surprise me. I'm very encouraged by that result. Um, in terms of the new world, I'm also not surprised at all that that is the next one and that it's fine for position. Indeed, these are two major areas of focus for us. Um, so it's very consistent with our view. Um, US versus China, we're, we're convinced that there, there are better ways of getting that exposure and it certainly will need to develop over time. Business as unusual, I'm not surprised that that's the third one. First of all, it's a bit more of a mixed bag. It's not just one theme, it's probably two or three themes. So the fact that it's, um, it's coming last is not such a surprise at the same time it's still um, it's clearly well represented which i think is is uh, is reflecting probably the biggest focus on things like e engagement would be my guess but i'd be interested in people's feedback thanks for that we'll be, so we'll be able to discuss this more in the q a so don't forget um pop your questions in the q a if you have any for nick we'll pick those up at the end um, but for now we're going to hand over to kumul who's going to talk to us about proxy voting thanks kumul Thanks, Kylie. Thanks, Nick. Good afternoon, everyone. This is a great time to be talking about proxy voting, given we are in the thick of the AGM season in Australia. And as Nick rightly outlined, with the rise in the importance of ESG, investors have increasingly turned their attention to focusing on utilizing their proxy voting rights. So let's look at what is proxy voting. As a shareholder in a publicly traded company, investors have the right to vote at shareholder meetings. Usually each shareholder has one vote for each share they hold. Proxy voting is the primary method by which a shareholder can influence a company's operations, its corporate governance and other important issues. So let's see in our next slide, what are these important issues that investors are focusing on? Typically, the issues that shareholders evaluate during annual shareholder meetings focus on long-term benefits to a company. This year, we saw a combined of five key themes receiving investor attention across the Australian and the New Zealand markets. The first being social issues, the impact of COVID pandemic. The pandemic revealed how a global health crisis can become a profound social issue. These extraordinary circumstances led investors in Australia and New Zealand to focus on understanding how companies in their portfolios are managing their key social risks, such as ensuring health, safety, and well being of employees, customers, and other stakeholders, managing equality, diversity, and inclusion, as well as managing operations and supply chains. The second theme is that of executive remuneration. This has been a long trending theme and focus for investors in Australia. Unlike New Zealand, ASX listed companies are required to put a remuneration report for shareholder approval at company AGMs. This year, the focus on executive remuneration sat in the context of the impacts of the pandemic. With several companies withdrawing guidance, both highlighted the need for setting meaningful targets for executives. Also, investors have closely scrutinized and questioned where company executives have received bonuses amidst poor financial performance and or widespread employee layoffs. Our third theme is that of diversity. The importance of diverse and inclusive workforce, and Nick touched on this as well, is, has been amplified, uh, the focus on it has been amplified amidst evaluating how boards and management have been responding to the pandemic crisis. For instance, investors noted that companies that had already established a strong culture of inclusion and diversity prior to the pandemic were more likely to have programs such as flexible working and remote work which are known to be particularly beneficial for women and for people with disabilities, but in pandemic, 
This allowed all employees to safely adapt to this new work arrangement. And so companies that embrace a culture of diversity and inclusion can be seen to demonstrate greater resilience. And so investors continued to focus on diversity this year. Our fourth theme is that of director elections. Director elections are a way for investors to hold individual directors accountable for their performance on a company's board. Over the years, in both Australia and New Zealand, we have observed investors paying close attention to the composition of boards, the independence in thought and judgment that directors bring in carrying out their oversight role, as well as individual directors' workload and capacity in being able to fulfill their director duty, not just when things are usual, but when a crisis escalates demand on their time commitment. And lastly, we have observed investors stepping up their support of shareholder red proposals at company AGMs in Australia. These proposals put forward by activists or NGO groups have focused on better company practices and disclosure on key ESG issues such as climate change and more recently, cultural heritage management and ind indigenous rights. So in summary, these five themes exemplify how in practice, the macro trend that Nick talked about is being put to action by investors in focusing on the environmental, social and governance issues at portfolio companies. So we have covered why proxy voting is important to investors, what investors are focusing on. And now in our next slide, let's look at how this has played out in practice through a couple of recent AGM examples. The first case example of AGL's recent AGM speaks to the executive remuneration trend in our previous slide, that investors are closely paying attention to alignment of executive pay and company performance. AGL is an ASX listed company. It is Australia's largest electricity generator. At the company's AGM this month, about 45% of votes received uh, on company's remuneration proposal received an against vote. Investors protested here on what they viewed was a generous CEO bonus and performance targets set by the board that perhaps weren't challenging enough. A second case example of BHP striking an 11th hour heritage deal before AGM speaks to the trend of shareholder resolutions in our previous slide. BHP is dual listed both on the Australian and the London Stock Exchange, and it is a resources and mining company. Following the blast of the Jukan Gorge rock shelters in the Pilbara region of Western Australia this year, investors and activists turned their attention to demand better cultural heritage management practices at Australian mining companies, including BHP. A group of investors submitted a resolution at BHP's AGM asking the company to immediately stop mining that could disturb, destroy, or desecrate Aboriginal cultural heritage. The company took this investor concern seriously and promptly engaged with the traditional owners to agree a set of principles around Aboriginal health heritage management in Australia. And the shareholder resolution was subsequently withdrawn. Examples such as this also remind us of the important role that investors can play in driving better company practices and social outcomes that are also financially prudent. Now, this brings me to a wrap of this section. And now we would love to hear your views on the next polling slide. And so the question here is, where we would like to get your perspective, which of the following themes are most important to you? Director accountability, climate change, executive remuneration, impacts of COVID and cultural heritage management. I can see the votes coming in with director accountability, 
leading, followed by climate change. Very nice. So very consistent with our polling results uh, at the end of next section. So climate change leads the importance followed by a director accountability. And rightly so, that is the theme and the trend that we've observed. And with this, I'm gonna pass back to Kylie uh, for the Q&A round. Thanks. Hi everyone, and thanks uh, Kumul for that great uh, presentation. Uh, so just a reminder, you can still put your questions into the Q&A function, um, but we do have a few coming through here. I'm gonna to come to you, Nick, with the first one. So it's it's referencing um, the, the gray, the green, and the in-between that you were talking about in terms yeah. of the, the carbon transition. Um, it says in the, the, the in-between category is interesting when it comes to ESG screens, as it's where companies are typically disregarded by managers on the basis that they have too much exposure to fossil fuels at, at a certain point in time, whilst ignoring their long-term trajectory. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, this is absolutely the critical issue. I think it's, we, we talk about the gray, the green and the in-between very specifically to, to talk about is a continuous spectrum. These are not distinct categories. Um, and as we've already seen, markets don't just respond to bad news, they respond to good news as well. So it's really important to, to capture, you know, the positive outlook for companies that at the moment, on the face of it, may actually have, um, may actually look like uh, they are very exposed to climate transition risk. Um, there's lots of things that companies can do um, and you can capture the information some of it quantitatively, things like manager record and managing uh, environmental issues on statements that they've made, words aren't actions, but they're better than no words. Um, and sometimes it's the level of patents that they have. You know, people would think about Tesla being incredibly advanced in the electric vehicle space, but actually Toyota have probably got more patents in, in place than Tesla. So maybe there's an interesting future to come. Um, so I think it's some of these nuances that you really need to bring out. Now, some of those are quantitative, but clearly, I think the real fire here is um, in employing uh, qualitative fundamental managers who are able to really assess the credibility of, of some of that, that quantitative data and the forward-looking elements of it. I mean, there's another issue as well at the moment, which of course we've seen massive dispersion divergence between uh, the cleaner uh, companies and the dirtier companies, if we want to, sorry about the... Um, generalization there, but we have seen quite a bifurcation in things like tech versus energy, say. Um, and of course, that begs the question as to whether that is, you know, that, that level of outperformance is something you really want to immediately build in. So thinking about the transition, think about those companies in the energy space that really can transition, those that are, are moving from having a fossil based, fossil fuel based energy production towards one that is increasingly renewables and investing in technology and R&D and so on. It's absolutely critical, really critical. Yeah, thanks, Nick. Um, I'm gonna to come to you next, um, Kumal. And so we've just got a question here asking if maybe you've got a couple of examples where perhaps shareholders have gotten um, you know, quite involved and stepped up and given support to shareholder resolutions. Absolutely, Kylie. Um, so the first six months of 2020 saw about um, I think 13 shareholder proposals at four AGMs um, and five resolutions received about one third of the vote in favor. And so when you compare this to the trend that was in 2019, there was probably um, four shareholder resolutions at two AGMs and no resolution received over 10% of vote. Um, and so the key AGMs that we were talking about, which received a very strong support were Woodside, Santos, Rio, QBE, um, and the resolutions ranged from climate change and predominantly were relating to climate change disclosure, but also covered um, things like, um, you know, for, Q, for, uh, for QBE, um, World Heritage Management around their Ramsar property. So really a mix of proposals with climate change being the key one that leads the interest and support there. Thanks. 
Thanks, Kumal. Um, I'm, I'm going to come back to you, Nick. So um, there's a question here about Mercer's view on alpha expectations in equity markets going forward, as well as overall uh, volatility, uh, question mark. Is it elevated and is there going to be more cross-sectional volatility? Yeah, so certainly cross-sectional volatility we'd expect um, to see coming through. I mean, what's fascinating in the equity markets at the moment is is what's going on in terms of dispersion. Um, I mean, it's entirely entirely possible that dispersion could stay wise because there are big structural trends actually underlying that. But at the same time, you could argue that's a, um, a, a very positive outlook for value as it, you know, the elastic band's gone just a bit too far and then it comes back, et cetera. So there's, um, th there's good opportunities for alpha. An overall statement on alpha expectations, I think is really, really hard because I think increasingly what you're going to see is it's going to be driven by it's going to be driven by the positioning of those portfolios in light of the structural trends and the stresses and strains that that's doing to valuations at, at the time. Um, alpha generally is worse when markets are highly concentrated, um, and certainly in the recent period we've seen a lot of concentration in the winners. Um, certainly not just in tech space, but even more broadly than that, and in tech and healthcare and so on. Um, and that means if you were in that space, you did fantastically well, but a large number of managers were not. And of course, if you don't have that diversity in markets, then it naturally pulls down the averages for active management. I wouldn't suggest that. I think the last couple of years are really fair of long-term going forward. Um, but it is an interesting question. I mean, why, why shouldn't you get um, a percent of alpha from, from managers going forward? I, I I don't see any reason exploration over um, over utilities penalizes coal versus oil and gas, which are um, you know they have different trajectories really in terms of that climate transition. Um, so yes, yeah, so I, I certainly look out for that paper, climate transition indices. Um, it's uh, it, it's it's far more helpful for those constrained clients who really need an index exposure within their um, equity. This is a much better way to go. Uh, okay, so you're very popular today, Nick. So there's another one here just asking about the best way to implement uh, opportunistic public credit strategies. Are, the, are we talking hedge funds here? Um, and can Mercer help implement these? We are talking hedge funds, but we're also talking strategies such as multi-asset credit. Um, so multi-asset credit, they tend to play up and down the credit spectrum. Um, they can take money off the table. They can opportunistically apply. They can use that beta exposure. Um, they tend to, can be highly dynamic. Um, they are a fully active strategy, but in this kind of environment, um, we've actually just had our Chicago forum and a couple of managers were talking about the opportunities developing in this fallen angel space, you know, where we're likely to see, expecting to see something like $200 billion of, um, of, of fallen angels, which are these, these companies that have fallen out of the uh, triple B into high yield. Um, and you know, sometimes they fall too far because people are wedded to indices. It creates opportunities in that space for a bit of um, a bit of bounce back. You basically get more, more yield than uh, the default risk that you're taking on. Um, and one of the managers, I think, referred to it as um, you know, once in a generation. I don't know whether that's I wouldn't want to use that term myself just yet. We're doing some research on it at the moment. But these are the kind of opportunities the multi-asset credit managers can get into. But they can also get into um, some of the opportunities popping up in the leverage loan space. Um, as well as in the securitized um, debt space. So they have full flexibility to, to really go. Thanks, Nick. Um, so maybe just the last question, which I might just cover off on, and I know it's topical, so I'll just make sure that we cover it. It's asking about the US election results and what will be the likely um, effect on markets. So as I guess current polls and perhaps what the market is expecting at the moment uh, is, is a Biden win. I think where there is less certainty and we've, we've seen a little bit of a pullback in the probability um, of the Democrats securing the Senate. Um, so still on balance, I think the expectations at this point are for a, for a blue wave through the House uh, and the, the Senate, um, but with a little, uh, less certainty, if you like, around the, the um, you know, who's actually going to secure the, the Senate. And that's probably going to be the big uh, question mark as to how the market reacts. So I think if we see a blue wave, um, the, the expectation is that the markets would view that quite favourably. 
specifically because um, the focus in the near term for a Biden government is going to be supporting the economy through the COVID uh, period and through the COVID recovery period when it comes. Um, so uh, seem to be quite stimulatory. Um, so that, that, that would be our expectation there. But we do know that uh, elections and the market's responses to elections can be very difficult to, to predict. Um, so we probably caution against taking too many bets on market action um, in the lead up to the election over the next couple of and days. And the accuracy of polls predicting the result as well. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> so yeah, I guess our, our, um, our caution would be not, not to take any bets on the election result in your portfolios, but perhaps just to check your portfolios for maybe any unintended risk um, exposures that you might have there and, and look to tidy them up as we go into what's not, not too far away the next, um, next, next week or so. All right, we are out of time. I am aware we, we didn't get to a couple of questions, so apologies for that. Um, hopefully you'll be able to join us again uh, next time or pick up some of our research papers that cover off on some of the points that you've um, asked here. Or indeed, as Nick said earlier, make sure you register for our, our Global Investment Forum uh, that we will be holding virtually in March next year because we will be drilling into um, many of these topics more as part of the, the forum. But we'll leave you for now. Thank you very much for your attendance today.